a good start. A great pleasure to welcome another IAS veteran, Tracy. She will tell us about thermal squeeze out strong interacting dark matter. And since the pandemic is over, the president said, we will go to dinner. Unfortunately, I will not be able to come, but Matthias will come. His email address is here. If you want to join us, you're welcome. And please send him an email by 4 p.m. so that he knows how to make a reservation. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm always very happy to be back at IAS. Um, so what I want to tell you about today in the seminar is a class of ideas that my collaborators and I have been thinking about recently on getting really heavy dark matter that is nonetheless coupled to the standard model. Um, there are other things that I work on. I'm going to talk at the core lunch tomorrow about some work on um, early universe tests of exotic energy injections. I talked a little bit at Astro Coffee today about the lactic center excess. If you want to hear about any of the other stuff, I'm around the rest of today and tomorrow. So I want to just swing by my office and have a chat. But um, for now, yeah, I want to talk about strongly interacting heavy dark matter. Okay, so I spend most of my time thinking about dark matter and how we might look for it. If you're interested in the more general experimental program for dark matter, I've spent a lot of my time thinking about that over the summer as part of the SOMAS process, so feel free to come and talk to me about that now. But where I want to begin, I'm going to assume that everyone here knows what dark matter is and give only a brief introduction to that problem, but then I want to give an introduction to sort of the standard um, wisdom about how we might get the abundance of dark matter in the universe. I want to talk about thermal freeze out, the thermal mass window, which in that mechanism works, and the unitarity bound, which we usually use to set upper limits on the mass of the dark matter that's produced by that set of mechanisms. Then I want to talk about what happened when we started thinking about heavy dark matter that could get close to that bound, which led us to think about strongly interacting dark sectors where there are phase transitions. Then I want to walk you through the estimate that we did of if you did have a first order phase transition in the dark sector, what uh, that could do to the dark matter abundance. And I'll tell you that this can lead to a second phase, which we call squeeze out, that dramatically reduces the amount of dark matter in the universe. And that can prevent dark matter candidates that you would normally think would overclose the universe are actually perfectly acceptable. And so I'll talk about some features of this scenario, the limit that we call the accidentally asymmetric limit, what you end up with to the relic density. The punchline of this is going to be where that normally we think the dark matter that interacts with the standard model should have an upper mass bound of about 100 TeV or so, that's the standard unitary limit. Scenarios like this pretty naturally predict dark matter in the PeV to EeV range. So, uh, and if time permits, I'll talk about just an explicit real light of model that is an explicit simple realization of this kind of scenario, what kind of constraints you get as, result, as a result, and some extra features that show up fairly generically once you actually find it. Okay, so uh, please feel free to ask questions as I go, um, and, and unless you would prefer to hold them for the end. And uh, yeah, I'll get started. And I guess I just also wanna say this work was done in collaboration with this great group of people, and uh, Poyer Asadi and Eric Kramer are postdocs who I'm where Saudi, I know at least, is on the faculty market this year, and it will break. Okay, so let's begin with my obligatory one dark matter motivational slide, which is we have pretty good evidence that there's some component of the universe that is about 84% of all the matter in the universe, as measured from the cosmic microwave background. We know that it gravitates and has mass, but if it scatters or emits or absorbs light at all, we have not yet convincingly detected that signal. So really, it's transparent matter. We believe that it interacts weakly or not at all with the particles that we do know about, except through gravity. And we have enough information to say that this isn't explained by physics that we currently understand. We know that in the cosmic microwave background, it's depicted here from observations of galactic rotation curves that suggest that the galaxy we live in and most other galaxies are surrounded by a large halo of dark matter. And from observations of non-equilibrium systems, most famously the bullet cluster, which suggests that there is mass in the universe whose gravity does not trace the distribution of observed matter. So there are many questions associated with dark matter, such as, you know, what is this stuff? Is it a particle? Is it a particle? Is it many kinds of new particles? Are what are black holes? Is it, is it something else? But one very sharp question you might ask is, right, we've measured one number precisely about dark matter, which is how much of it there is in the universe, this 84% number. So how do you get that number? And there are many possible answers to this question, as there are many dark matter scenarios. 
But a classic answer that has been around for a long time, and it is sometimes called the wind miracle, or a consequence of this is called the wind miracle, is classic thermal freeze out. Again, this is not the unique solution, but it's a nice sort of solution that doesn't require you to know much about the UV physics um, to get the right answer. So, so let's just go to it. So the picture here starts with the assumption that there is some non-gravitational interaction between dark matter and the standard model that brings them into thermal equilibrium in the early universe and that allows for interconversion reactions in the early universe, schematically shown here as two dark matter particles can convert into standard model particles or, or vice versa. So if that's the case, then early in the universe when the temperature is much hotter than the dark matter mass, the, the, this interaction running left to right will populate the dark matter and the dark matter will have comparable abundance to any other radiation species in the standard model bath. But of course, as the universe expands, it cools down and eventually the temperature of the universe will drop below the dark matter mass. At that point, while this forward interaction may still be efficient, the reverse interaction will be kinematically suppressed. So only the hottest standard model particles will be able to form dark matter particles. At that point, so long as this interaction stays in equilibrium, the dark matter abundance will start falling exponentially following the Boltzmann distribution. So this sketch on the right hand side is a plot of the dark matter from moving number density versus time. This is from a textbook. Carbon Turner. So early on, we have just the commuting number density is constant. It's radiation. In this epoch where dark matter behaves like radiation, temperature drops below the mass of the dark matter, we move into this stage two of exponential depletion. Now, so at this stage, annihilation is open, reverse annihilation is not. And if we lived in a non-expanding universe, this depletion could just continue forever. Oh, it's put down here. But because we live in an expanding universe, there's another time scale in the problem. And once the um, time scale for dark matter to be depleted through annihilation becomes long compared to the expansion time scale for the universe, the co-moving dark matter abundance flattens off. This annihilation becomes inefficient. We enter this third phase, and we say that the annihilation has frozen out, and the late time dark matter abundance is fixed. So this is attractive for a couple of reasons. It means that so long as this interaction was present, you don't care about what the dark matter was doing before it came into thermal equilibrium. And we don't need to worry about how the dark matter bath was populated at the end of inflation or anything like that. It gets populated dynamically just from the standard model. And from an experimental perspective, this is attractive because it means that the interaction that connects the dark matter to the standard model, which we'd like to look for in our experiments, is exactly what determines the dark matter abundance. So by Quite, if the annihilation rate is too small, you'll get too much dark matter left. If it's too large, you'll have too little dark matter left. So we can do, we can look at the Goldilocks solution and figure out what annihilation cross section we needed to get the right amount of dark matter. At this point, we learn that this scenario has another kind of attractive feature, which is that the cross section that you need to get the right amount of dark matter is a special cross section. So for measuring the relic abundance, we can infer what the annihilation rate for this process had to be in the early universe. We get a number that is about 2 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second, which if we put that in particle physics units, is about 1 over 25 TeV squared. I mean, parametrically, this is just 1 over the Planck mass, which describes the expand, which you know, relates to the expansion rate times the temperature at matter radiation equality, which determines how much matter you have relative to radiation in the universe. And so if we were to say, all right, we want a cross-section that's 1 over 25 TeV squared, what if we say, well, at tree level, this cross-section should be like some coupling alpha squared divided by some mass scale squared, what mass scale will we need? That suggests a mass scale around whatever the relevant dark coupling is times 25 TeV. So if we say, all right, um, what if alpha was something like the electroweak coupling that we know and love, so it's something in the order of 10 to the minus 2, then that suggests a mass scale around a few hundred GeV, which is a mass scale that we care about for other reasons. So that is called the wind miracle where wind is weakly interacting massive particle. But this thermal relic story is more general than, than just the wind miracle. You know, all you need is this characteristic scale, and you can do that by much lighter dark matter with a much tinier effective coupling than the standard model, say if the coupling than the standard model is not direct, but goes through some intermediate mediated particle, or you can do it with a heavier particle um, if you're willing for your coupling to be larger than 10 to the minus 2. However, just from looking at this expression, you might guess, hmm, I'm going to start running into problems if I want my um, if I want the mass scale for my dark matter to be much larger than about 25 TeV. Like the sort of naive tree-level estimate you then might say, okay, I'm going to need my theory to be strongly coupled for that to be the case. And at that point, this 
sort of tree level estimate, treat the cross sections alpha squared over m squared is likely to break down. So more generally, you can say, all right, there is a, an upper limit just from unitarity, just from probability conservation on the amount of annihilation, on the depletion rate, the amount of annihilation that I can have starting from any given partial wave. And this is just a quantum mechanics expression for um, the upper limits on the total cross section in a not in a non-relativistic process. And it behaves, and it behaves like this. So J here is the total angular momentum in the partial wave that we're looking at. So what that means, we know that this freeze out process is happening when the temperature of the universe is dropped just below the dark matter mass. So VRL is still relatively close to the speed of light. So if we know which partial waves contribute, then we can, then this corresponds to a limit on the mass of the dark matter. If the mass of the dark matter becomes too heavy, it will just not be possible to attend this cross section. And so given, a, so given a set of partial waves that contributes to significantly the depletion and a velocity scale for the freeze out and the assumptions of standard cosmology that go into this calculation, we get an upper limit on the dark matter mass. If we want to saturate that upper limit on the dark matter mass, typically we're going to need some combination of strong couplings and, uh, and, and long range interactions that strongly enhance the annihilation rate. So the resulting mass limit that you get when you do the calculation carefully is only quoted as about, uh, is often quoted as about 100 to 200 TeV. This is valid when the number of partial waves that contribute is pretty small. That's um, somewhat generically the case. The contact interactions higher partial waves are suppressed at low velocity. The, the P wave is suppressed by V squared. The D wave is suppressed by V to the four and so on. So even if V is like 0.1, that still becomes a significant suppression. But for bound states or extended objects, the higher partial waves can contribute pretty significantly. And for sufficiently extended dark matter objects can push the, um, can push the unitarity bound up to about the PEV scale. But roughly this order of magnitude from about 100 TeV to a PEV is where we expect um, just considerations of unitarity and considerations of probability conservation to mean you cannot get the depletion cross-section large enough to sufficiently deplete the dark matter in the early universe. The so the generic the, the dark matter particles come from bound states, or that the dark matter particle, each dark matter particle itself is the bound state. So. Um e either. So if you so you can have a situation where the dark matter particles are mostly you know individual particles, but the fact that they can form a bound state acts like it's effectively an extra annihilation channel that can help you saturate the unitarity bound. If you've got um large composite dark matter objects, so the interactions are not really contact interactions, that can mean that you get larger contributions from higher partial waves. But these guys argued, and, and there are actually all the statements saying that there's no unitarity bound on composite dark matter for this region, like make them big enough and you can use a lot of partial waves. Um, this paper argues that that's not true just because you're not in a vacuum in the early universe, like you're, you're in this plasma, it interacts with the states. If you have really large shallowly bound things, they'll tend to get dissociated by the plasma before they can annihilate, and that's how they get this top one PV number. Even assuming that it's coupled, how does it depend on the number of species? Imagine the, the number of them. Yeah, good. Okay, so so if we, um, right, so, the, so this is a question of getting the, of the, so back. So the calculation I'm showing you so far assumes that 100% of the dark matter is one species. So if I say, okay, let's say I have 100 species and I want them to each make up 1% of the dark matter, then the unitarity bound on each of those species individually will get stronger because you need a larger annihilation rate to deplete you down to 1% of the dark matter abundance. So that will force the mass scale lower. So, uh, so what? So what are what are the so you know one this this is one of the reasons why a lot of searches for dark matter annihilation essentially say if we can get to 100 TeV then we're done. Basically, like if, at least for this scenario, if we get to 100 TeV, we can um, completely close the thermal relic window. And, and I think, you know, like, I mean, that's true when it's a good general statement for at least the simplest version of this scenario. But there's a well known caveat to this, which is that this all assumes that we know what the cosmological history is. And if the cosmological history is modified in some way, this limit can go away. And of course, there are also like just non thermal scenarios where the dark matter is never in thermal equilibrium with the standard model to begin with. And then you don't have a lot of it being needed to deplete. So what I, what I want to talk about next is if you start thinking about models that come close to saturating this bound, 
So, you know, they have, they have rather strong interactions and they're rather heavy. Then there are modifications to the cosmology that can be pretty dogmatic. And in particular, uh, where we started thinking about this was the case of a, was the case of a heavy confining dark sector. So in some sense, a confining dark sector is a fairly natural idea, you know, about QCD in the standard model today. And you can do multiple variations of this scenario. So I'll be thinking about a case where today the dark matter is composed of the dark baryons, but if you have um, if, if you have symmetries that can stabilize other dark particles in the theory, they could also be contributors to the dark matter today. But for the moment, we'll just assume it's the you know it's the dark baryons that are the stable ones. But sufficiently early in the universe, when the temperature was well above the confinement scale, rather than the appropriate degrees of freedom being dark hadrons, they would have been a, uh, a dark quark on plasma. So if something like this is going on, then as soon as you start to say, okay, maybe there could be a dark sector like this, then there is some level of automatic modification of the early universe cosmology, which is that there has to be a phase transition from the, or, or, or a crossover from the dark quark on plasma to the dark baryons today. So in the literature, when we started working on this, there were some statements that said, okay, that's fine. The, the, that conversion is very simple. You figure out how many dark quarks you have going into the dark phase transition, and then you divide by three if it says you three, and that's the number of dark baryons that you have left after the phase transition. So what, what I want to show you here is that it's, uh, it's not that simple. So the caveat is this is not going to be a detailed calculation using advanced non-perturbative techniques. So in, in that sense, I, this may not uh, live up all of the standards of IAS high energy theory seminars, Mostly this is going to be dimensional analysis. We're going to make simplifying approximations. And the aim is to just understand the physics of what goes on in this situation, derive the first pass estimate of the resulting physical, of the physical effects and how things fall. So that's the caveat. But um, so what happens in this dark sector? So I'm going to be thinking about a situation where the dark quarks are actually pretty heavy relative to the confinement scale. This simplifies the problem in a lot of ways. But in particular, it will see that going into the phase transition, the dark quarks are already pretty underabundant, and the plasma is mostly just a pure gluon plasma with rare dark quarks around. In this case, for pure young metals, we expect a first order phase transition for SUN, where n is greater than or equal to three, just, just based on lattice studies. So what I'm going to talk about next is that if you do have a first order phase transition in a strongly interacting dark sector, then as well as the other possible observational effects of an early first order phase transition, this naturally strongly dilutes heavy thermal dark matter and points you to a higher mass scale. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, any, any, any questions so far before I just jump into the story of what happens in these kinds of scenarios? Okay, one's happy, coming too slow, all right. So there are two relevant mass scales in the problem here. There's the confinement scale and there's the dark quark mass. So here we're imagining these are not like the dark matter is not standard model quarks. This is its own dark sector, but um, so just in an, an SUN confining dark sector. At the moment, I'm not going to couple it to the standard model. We are going to need a coupling to the standard model to make this scenario work. I will, um, we will we'll discuss that later. But for the moment, we're just going to look at the dark sector dynamics. And this is like an extremely simplified version of, uh, of QCD. So our two scales are the confinement scale. That determines the phase transition temperature, the binding energies post-confinement, and the coupling in the dark sector above the confinement scale, just through the, um, just through the renormalization group running, and the quark mass, which determines, so the quark mass, among other things, determines the temperature at which the dark quarks freeze out. We're going to have both dark quarks and dark antiquarks in our sector. I'm going to start with the assumption that they're just symmetric. They can annihilate away. So then we have sort of two possible orderings. We have that standard thermal freeze out of the dark quarks and antiquarks into dark gluons. That can happen um, before confinement or after confinement. If confinement happens first and then freeze out happens in a universe where the appropriate degrees of freedom are the dark baryons and, uh, and dark blue balls, then, and we have some coupling to the standard model, then this will be similar to the previous case that I talked about. The annihilations will keep the dark baryons in equilibrium with the standard model up until the point where the annihilations freeze out, the relic abundance will be fixed. When the annihilation freezes out, and if our mass scale is heavier, then the PEV scale will have too much dark matter left at the end. 
So let's consider the other hierarchy where the dark fork mass is sufficiently heavier than the confinement scale that the freeze out happens first and then the phase transition happens afterwards. Okay. So in that case, the first stage is just freeze out. It happens as usual um, in the deconfined phase. So these are dark quarks and anti quarks annihilating into the mostly glow on plasma. Um, this sets the initial conditions for the phase transition. We're going to have some stable co moving density of dark quarks and anti quarks, which is um, much smaller than the abundance of the gluons, but they're non negligible. And if the dark quarks are heavier than the unitarity bound, we know a priori that this annihilation cross section has to be below the thermorelic cross section. So we're going to end up with too much dark matter going into the phase transition. But the universe is still super radiation dominated at this phase. So there's too much dark matter to the late universe, but um, it is a very small fraction of the total energy density. Okay. So then when we go into the first order phase transition, what happens? So once the temperature of the universe drops to around the confinement scale, bubbles of the confined phase will begin to form and grow. This is my picture of a first order phase transition in my cartoon of a first order phase transition. So in these little cartoons, this light blue indicates the dark quark on plasma, the black dots indicate the dark quarks and dark anti quarks, and the purple bubbles indicate the um, growth of the bubbles of the new phase. So, and there have been a couple of other papers which had, which had similar ideas uh, around the same time, but, um, but with a slightly, but with a different mechanism to us, they were thinking less about strongly interacting dark sectors and more about um, just like that phase more about phase transitions where there's some mass gap for the dark particles that stops them from getting outside the bubbles. So the issue is that in this situation, the dark quarks cannot easily get into the bubbles of the new phase because they're not color singlet. If we try to push them into the new phase, there'll be a string that forms to the surface. If there were light quarks in the system, we might say, all right, so then you expect that string to break, produce a new quark and anti quark. One of them can team up with the original quark and they can annihilate or get into the new phase. But because the dark quarks are extremely heavy in this case, the time scale for that is, is actually very long. So these dark quarks, in order to get into these bubbles of the new phase, they have to find some other dark quarks and, um, and, and form a color singlet state. And due to the low density of these dark quarks, that's actually really hard. What is a much faster time scale is that if one of these dark quarks encounters one of these expanding bubbles of the new phase, they will sort of hit the wall of the bubble and then recoil off. So as these bubbles grow, the effect is to herd the dark quarks around. And you can, and you, this was essentially just, we, we just did dimensional analysis estimate to, to get that answer. So, you know, the analogy here is a heavy quark hitting a bubble wall is kind of like a bowling ball hitting a trampoline. Since I wrote this, I went when I wrote this, I looked on YouTube and saw that there are actually many videos of people bouncing on bowling balls off trampolines. They've, trampolines are quite elastic and they can shoot bowling balls quite high. So, but yeah, so we just worked out the estimate for this rebound time by looking at the velocity of the quarks divided by the acceleration of the quarks due to the bubble wall. And this turned out to be the fastest time scale on the problem by, um, by, by quite a large factor. And in particular, it's very much faster than the time scale to create new quarks and anti quarks from the vacuum just because the quarks are really heavy. Okay. So, sorry, can I ask you? Yeah. So, how fast do these uh, the, the, the bubbles grow? How fast do these bubbles grow? They're growing good. So, um, I can go through the detailed parametrics in our paper, but um, so, first thing is the whole phase transition is significantly fast, it is pretty fast compared to Hubble. The phase transition, I think, in our paper, our estimate was it occurs in about 1% of the Hubble time. So the expansion of the universe is a slow time scale relative to the bubble growth. That's it. And you might say, OK, so surely will, the bubble walls will just grow at close to the speed of light. Why not? Um, so as the bubble wall expands, there is heat produced at the interface. And if the heat just stays there, it will, or if the bubbles try to expand faster than the heat can diffuse away, it will heat you back up above the critical temperature. And so then the bubbles are no longer favored to expand. So the thing that limits, one thing that limits how fast you can expand is just how fast you could transport the heat away. That's the thing where to do it in detail, you, you might need to do a proper simulation of this. So, so we again, just sort of did a dimensional analysis estimate for how fast the bubble expands. 
That does mean we found that when we did this, we predicted that the bubbles should expand um, pretty significantly subluminally. This in particular means that this phase transition is, um, is not good for making gravitational waves because it's, it's kind of slow. The bubbles don't expand very fast. You don't have many really high energy bubble collisions, um, but it's still pretty fast compared to them. But, um, but it's, yeah, okay. Okay, so, and, and, and again, you know, all of these estimates are dimensional analysis estimates. You know, someone who is more about like the lattice and all the universe simulations than I did could try to do a more detailed simulation of this. It, it seems hard. All right, so as these bubbles continue to grow, eventually they'll form most of the universe and we'll go through the percolation phase where we go from the universe being mostly in the old phase to mostly in the new phase. So at this point, instead of having bubbles, we will switch over to a situation where there are dark quarks and dark antiquarks are trapped in isolated shrinking pockets of the new phase. So the heavy quarks largely will have been herded into these pockets just by bouncing off the bubble walls. But then what happens is some of our assumptions start to fail because as these pockets continue to shrink after percolation, they will compress the heavy quarks to high density. And remember, all my estimates before were on the basis of all of these dark quarks are very rare. It's hard for them to find other dark quarks and hadronize, or hard for them to find dark antiquarks and annihilate. That's what freeze out means. Uh, but now within these pockets, the density can be much higher than the cosmological average density. So this allows both annihilations that had previously frozen out to restart. And we need to reconsider this statement that dark quarks find it hard to find other dark quarks to, uh, to hadronize with. So now, yeah. I, I don't know if this law for the only detail of yeah, dynamics. So. You, want, you want a first order transition between a phase with one number of particles to a phase with another spectrum. Yes. That's all the things, right? Yep. Then why can't you just take a scalar field with two mini now? And have some particles as much as different in the two mini. Yeah, you totally and then, can. You don't need, and then you don't need all the strong dynamics. That's true. That's true. So the way that we came at this particular question was if we have a strongly interacting heavy dark sector, what happens to it? Um which but but you're right, like very similar dynamics can occur when you just have um, yeah, as as you say, when you just have a, when you just have a scalar field that's going from one minimum to another. And that changes uh, the masses of the particles in your field. So this one, I think, um, I think Hong Jung and Ji use use this use that version of the idea, where you have particles that get stuck, just like this. You have particles that get stuck in the bubbles of the old phase, just because to get out into the new phase, there's a big mass gap. Um, they 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 would need a large increase then, in mass. But then it would be very easy to couple. So everything would be weakly coupled. Um, yeah. So. I mean, so so I guess like I mean, even in that case, if it's a if it's a first order phase transition, like the details of how the of how the bubble network expands and grows can can be non-trivial. Uh, but but yes, I I agree I agree that is an easy problem. You should not take what I'm saying as the only way to realize this is strong dynamics. But I think it will, so, will end up being the same it, because so, the physics that enters is exactly the same. So the I agree that up to this point it is the same. What the difference between the two is how easy it is for the um, is how easy it is for the stuff inside to get out of the pockets. So in their case, what they were looking at, what what their final state is, the dark quarks never get out of the pockets. They just stay stuck in there. The pockets can pack down, and you end up with like compact nuggets, foamy balls of the dark matter, which can't get out because of the mass gap. That is a completely viable final state. There was another paper that I cited. That are where the pockets like really squash down and you end up with primordial black holes being sourced by this. The example that I'm going, but, but in our case, that's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because the dark matter can, because the dark matter has multiple ways to get out of the pocket. It can annihilate and hadronize. So yes, in, in some sense, the conceptual difference between what happens to the kind of scenario we're thinking about here is, is just that um, our, our dark quarks have a way to get out of the pockets. So. Somebody is writing on my slide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, right. so, but yeah, but yes, the, the whole the whole first order phase transition story is not specific to strong dynamics. It's just the same as the first order phase transitions are a highly inhomogeneous process, and then you can imprint that in homogeneity on the dark matter distribution, 
and that can lead to a range of consequences. But if one of the things that your dark matter can do is annihilate, then a consequence for making it very inhomogeneous is that now it annihilates much better. You've got to see my little cartoon of the orange being squeezed. Hopefully that was visible through, uh, through, the, red, through the red lines. <laughs> So yeah, so this step is the only step that is doing more than a dimensional analysis calculation. Here we just write down Boltzmann equations for the processes and solve them numerically. And the result that you get, so this is an example for result that you get. So this is like looking as a fraction of the initial quarks. So for this, for this step, I'm going to assume that there are equal numbers of quarks and antiquarks in the coppers. So there's just one number that's you track. Um, that's a bad approximation at the end, but we'll and we'll see why from this. So if I assume that this symmetric red line is showing how many just individual quarks I have as a function of the initial abundance, green line is showing how many diquarks I have inside the pocket at any given time, black line is showing how many um, variants I have inside the pocket at any given time, and then this uh, dotted, uh, this, um, this, dot this dotted purple line is showing the abundance of hadrons that have, um, that have, that have gotten out of the pocket. So this is the final abundance of dark matter at late times. The orange line is something else, which I will explain on the next slide. But the lesson from this particular simulation is in this example, this is about um, 10 to the minus six. So all but about 10 to the minus six of the dark hadrons get annihilated, of the dark quarks get annihilated away before they can hadronize. And, and I think, I haven't tested this in detail, but I think a way to understand this is just the annihilation is basically a two-body process and the hadronization requires a three-body process. So if you're gradually increasing the density, the two-body processes effectively just come in before the three-body processes and they tend to win. Now, there's an effect, there are a couple of effects that I am ignoring here. Um, one is I said, I'm gonna assume that every pocket has equal numbers of quarks and anti-quarks. Um, but that's not true. Like overall, the universe can be symmetric, but when I'm forming these bubbles, like there is not a dynamic mechanism that is going to ensure the same number of quarks and antiquarks in every pop, in every bubble. So if I initially have like roughly capital N total quarks, I expect just by chance an asymmetry of square root N between the quarks and the antiquarks. So what that means is that, you know, I assume here the annihilation could continue forever, um, and, but, but that's not really true. It can only continue until I run out of whichever species is less abundant. So this gives me a flaw on how much, you know, what once the less abundant species is finished annihilating, the others are going to have to nice because they don't have anything else to do. That orange dash line is what this flaw would be in this particular simulation. It's around 10 to the minus seven in this case. So this suggests that the annihilation gets us most of the way down to this floor, but maybe, although maybe not quite there. Now, and just, yeah. just, what is the time scale that you use for the Boltzmann equation, the collision time scale? Uh, the time, so, okay, so um, there's an overall time scale, which is like the rate at which the bubble, yeah, so I, I, think, I think I have a bonus slide about like exactly what the Boltzmann equations are, but it's basically you just, you need to include the rates for all the processes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so like the collision term in the Boltzmann equation is built out of the rates for all these processes. Which we just which we just estimate parametrically, and then we test the effects of multiplying them by a factor of ten, or by, like by changing the rates by an order of magnitude either way, and see how much the answer changes. And then there's an overall time scale, which is how fast the pockets are shrinking. Mm -hmm. Which for which, by default, we use this statement that it's limited by like how how fast you can move heat away from the bubble boundaries. But that ignores another important effect, which is. We're ignoring the fact that as you squash these dark quarks in, the dark quarks will exert a pressure on, on the bubble walls, which will tend to slow the shrinkage of the pockets. We don't have an accurate model for this. We tried modeling it a couple of different ways, um, and, and the answers vary quite a bit. But when we did these parametric estimates, it indicated that this effect is likely to be large, and we don't have a good model for it. So that feels very frightening, right? That feels like, oh no, is, is the answer going to depend strongly on this? But the answer is that. It doesn't actually, this effect, we don't expect it to change the results very much because the effect is one-sided. It will slow down the rate at which the pockets are shrinking. And if you slow down the rate at which the pockets are shrinking, it means you spend more time in the lower density regime where annihilation is more efficient than hadronization. So the effect of including this quark pressure is to dial up the importance of annihilation relative to hadronization. But we know that there's this limit. Annihilation cannot cannot get you below this orange line. And with zero quark pressure, we were already at the purple line. 
So the most that turning out quark pressure can do is move the purple line down to the orange line. So that's the level at which, while this, this you know, estimate has a lot of order of magnitude estimates, in the end, it probably doesn't really matter. In the end, all that really matters is just the asymmetry of quarks and antiquarks in any individual pockets. Okay. And we scan, and that was one simulation, but we scanned the right wide range of input parameters and found that this was pretty generic. Even when we ignored the quark pressure, um, this survival fraction generally either saturated this accidentally asymmetric lower bound or came pretty close to it. And if we include the quark pressure, we just push it even close to saturation. So at least, which was already within a factor of a few. What happens if you do the analogous computation in this simplified model with the scale of field? Um, good. So, uh, but but you but you want to allow the dark matter to annihilate away. So whatever, just some scale of fields to do whatever they want. Yeah. So so in the um, so in the paper that I mentioned, the Hong Jung and Ji paper their dark matter wasn't annihilating. So the only way it had to get out of the pockets was to, um, was to like get enough energy to get them to overcome this mass gap. So it basically just never escapes. They don't have this question of how much gets out of the pockets because the answer is none of it does ever. It all ends up just packed into nuggets. You could do something like this uh, weekly interacting model where there is where the dark matter is annihilating. Once you squeeze it back together, it annihilates more efficiently. I expect in that case, um, it well, yeah. So, so if, if it's only options that it can annihilate or it has to overcome the mass gap, um, it'll, it kind of, it's like this, it doesn't have enough energy to overcome the mass gap. So I think then it will just annihilate away all the way down to this square root n when the, and you'll get exactly the same behavior that we have here. Like the, the, the only thing that matters is the square root n. And, and let's of course the, like, I mean, if, if there's some kind of like long range dark U1 or something, so there's dark electromagnetism and there actually is like some dynamics that can equalize the number of dark quarks and dark anti quarks, then, then that can change the answer. But, but aside from that, I would guess that if you add annihilation to their model, it looks exactly like ours. It's just you're more strongly, like, you, you also saturate this accidentally so, so just so to some respect, so so you have these uh, you have these bubbles where you're confined inside the bubble, mm -hmm. and you're saying that um, that uh, there's some root n fluctuations so that there was some asymmetry for more quarks and anti quarks inside yep. the bubble anyway. Uh, and and what are you assuming about what happens to the to the asymmetry? I mean, um, uh, what, what what why aren't they attached with like strings to the boundary and they get accelerated to the boundary and hit the boundary instead of uh, turning into mm -hmm. Baryons, which I think what, what you're assuming they do. Yeah, so so good. So I guess what, what I am assuming is that so I, I I am assuming that the pockets that you good. So yeah, so there's a tacit assumption here that percolation is very complicated. Like that's when I go from having the universe be mostly deconfined to mostly confined. And as I go through that intermediate stage, I'll probably have some complicated network of bubbles and pockets that are joined together by strings and that have a non-trivial topology. I am assuming for this estimate that if you look at a sufficiently far up the percolation, I can approximate the universe as being a bunch of isolated pockets, which, which are roughly spherical and which have this square root n asymmetry. So the um right, so so why so why aren't those pockets joined by strings? So in this picture, the pocket as a whole would need to be color singlet. Like, and if it's not, you'll have two pockets that are not color singlets that are joined by a string until, until they merge or whatever. But they can be color singlet, but color singlet does not mean that they necessarily have to have identical amounts of quarks and anti quarks. Like if this was U1, then like then it would be, right? Then, then it would be, you know, net charge zero means like equal amounts of positrons and electrons, whatever. I see. So but, you're, you're, you're saying that it's sort of like precisely uh, the, the, the the uh, asymmetry is uh, is accounted for not by strings joining you to other pockets, but by the net barrier number that you're going to yes. make out of all the quarks you have left. That's I'm right. sorry. Oh, and that assumes that this is a theory like SUN with four to different number. Yeah. It could easily be, say, SON back yep. to the theory, and then there's no barrier number. So yeah, so you could, yeah. So, so this is. So, I mean, this is SUN and specifically it's SU3, although I don't think much will change as you go up to higher SUN just because then 
know, like it, it just makes it harder to have your eyes and your death annihilation is going to win by even more. But, um, but, but yeah, you could certainly consider more complicated. You, you could consider other dark centers would have different behavior. But then you don't have this issue of how jump it works. Yeah, so so good. So then, um, yeah, so so then you might have to be more careful. Then, then, it, then it might not be the square root n that determines the final abundance. Then you might actually care a bit more about exactly how big is the annihilation cross section relative to hadronization phase, because it would matter. I mean, it's just some object that carries a symmetry because you want it to be. You, I, mean, you I, I want it to be stable. I want blue balls I that, want are, that are wiping right out this stuff, which you're going to make the case. I'm going to make the yeah. case. So. Uh, yeah, so, so I mean, I, I do. If I want to be the dark matter, I, I need that to be something that stabilizes the dark matter. But, but you know, I mean, but you could have some kind of black lines in my around a type dark matter. Anyway. So in this class of scenario, so in this particular, yeah, so there are lots of there are lots of variations on this. This is you know, not intended to be fully comprehensive. But in this variation, what it tells you is the post freeze out number density is, is the um, the final abundance of dark matter depends basically on two things. It depends on um, how many dark quarks did you have. Well, really, all it depends on is how many dark quarks did you have going into the phase transition. So what's the cosmological density of dark quarks going into the phase transition, and um, how big were the pockets of percolation? So how many dark quarks did you end up in each pocket, within each pocket of percolation? And for this, we just use an estimate from a paper by Ed back in 1984, which essentially estimates the radius of these pockets just by figuring out the time for the pockets to merge and says when the time for the pockets to merge is larger than the whole phase transition, that's, um, that, that gives you the characteristic length scale that the pockets will have coming out of percolation. And then we tried varying that number by an order of magnitude in each direction just to see how sensitive it was. And so in the end, you end up with a result that doesn't really depend on the details of the cross sections, so long as they're sufficiently large to saturate this some um, to, 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 sa to saturate this accidentally asymmetric limit. And this plot is showing as a function of the confinement scale and the ratio of the dark quark mass to the confinement scale, what kind of parameters you need to get the right relic density. And this um. Yeah, so this all this and the band around it is the varying this parametric estimate by an order of magnitude in each direction. And this corresponds to masses between about so these dashed lines for a constant mass, and it corresponds to preferred masses for the dark matter between about one and a thousand PV. So the summary of the cosmic history for the scenario is just that in addition to the original freeze out at the end, in the phase transition, there's this very abrupt drop. In the dark matter density, and it's basically just because first order phase transitions are inhomogeneous, and so you need to you so that will that will amp up annihilation or any other um, many body process in the early universe. And, Sorry, so yeah. In what way if you try to parameterize the difference between this scenario and the first one that you presented? How many parameters do you have imagined? Um, the what so the ones that matter are the um, uh, the dark quark mass of the confinement scale. This is one number. Two. Dark, dark quark mass confinement scale. Now, but so you also had the mass scale before. How many parameters were there? In the first slide you had, there were yeah. these three phases. Yeah. How many parameters were there? Oh, to, to set that, that, so, right. So, so that, yeah. So, um, so that depends on the mass of the dark matter and its annihilation cross section. Um, in this case, the mass of the dark, I mean, the mass of the dark matter is a genuine input parameter. Um, if, you, as, if you think you know what the confinement scale is and you know what the content is of the dark sector and you know how much higher the dark quark mass is the confinement scale, you can just run the couplings and get the couplings at, at the scale of the dark so matter. So there's only one more parameter. Uh, yeah, ma mass, yeah, that's right. It's the confinement scale. And if, and if you take the limit where that's it. I mean, like this assumes you're in a confining theory, right? Like in principle, you don't have to be in a confining theory, and you're, you know, maybe in the usual case, you don't necessarily have a confinement scale, and your coupling is whatever you want it to be, and it's completely unrelated to the mass scale, right? Like in in this case, it's you're you're effectively replacing the coupling scale with the confinement scale. Yeah. Okay. So you might ask, all right, so something like this could be true. If we have a heavy sector that is strongly interacting, or just a heavy sector that has a first order phase transition because you know it has a it has a scalar with two with two minima in its potential, 
uh, then the first order phase transition can have a pretty, can lead to a pretty dramatic reduction of the dark matter density in the early universe. But this also far depends almost exclusively on the dark sector physics. And so most signatures will depend on how you couple it to the standard model. Now, any first order dark sector phase transition can in principle give you a stochastic gravitational wave background. And that's probably the most generic signature of our weird early universe stuff happening in the dark sector. Doesn't you know, rely on non-gravitational couplings to the standard model. So that would be great. For the particular scenario that we looked at here, like the SU3 strongly interacting dark matter, as I said, the phase transition is kind of wimpy and kind of slow. Poya tried to estimate the gravitational wave signal and it's, um, and it's, and it's not very large. Well, it's very not large. So to explore other signatures, you can try coupling it to the standard model. So this was, yeah, we, so the example that we did here was just we put an AU1 B minus L portal to the standard model. Um, we, we gave the dark quarks uh, a charge under B minus L, and we introduced a new Z prime gauge boson. So this has two new parameters. You have the mass of the Z prime and the gauge coupling for, for the new U1. Now, so why do we need a portal to the standard model in the first place? Well, we've talked about this a bit, but there are two reasons, one of which is theorist convenience, and the other one of which actually changes the physics of the scenario. So the theorist convenience is just that it's helpful to keep these two sectors at the same temperature during freeze out of the phase transition, so you don't have to track two temperatures. But this is, I mean, this simplifies the calculation. It's not, I don't think it's fundamentally necessary at any level. But the other reason is provided decay channel for the blue balls. Now, you don't need to do this. You can say, all right, let, let's just have a scenario where the blue balls are the dark matter of the universe. Um, that's like, that. that's fine. It's probably, in, in that case, you know, you, you would, that's, you can suddenly have scenarios like that. The important question then will be, how does the blue ball abundance evolve? under their interactions after the phase transition. People have studied those scenarios where you have some kind of species that can undergo number changing interactions between itself and heats up the dark sector, sort of cannibal dark matter scenarios. Um, that can completely happen. Uh, we, we, wanted, we wanted to look at a case where it does. So, so we turned on this portal so that the blue balls could decay away, leaving only the dark area unstable. But we found that even Within, even having turned on this portal, it was pretty generic for some of the blue balls in this model to be metastable and decaying with a long lifetime. So th this is just that the, the effective operators that you end up, if you go through this channel, the effective operators that you write down to cause some of the blue balls to decay, in some cases, the, the lowest order operators that you can find are like dimension seven or dimension eight. So they're just rather long lived. In particular, that means that in parts of the parameter space, the blue balls are long lived enough to, dom to dominate the energy density of the universe before they decay, leading to an epoch of early matter domination. And when they do decay, that means that they, if they decay the standard model particles, they'll heat up the standard model bath by a lot, which further dilutes the dark matter abundance relative to the standard model. Now, this, this general effect has been something that's been known for a long time, that if you have anything that decays and heats up the standard model, that can dilute any pre-existing dark matter abundance. That's another way to evade the unitarity bound. Um, you, you just need you know, quite, quite a lot of the decaying species to have a meaningful effect. But so in the context of this model, it means that in, in reality, if you try to implement this, there are three drops. There's the initial freeze out of the dark matter. So this black line is the dark matter density. There's the phase transition, which squeezes out a lot of the dark matter. And then when the blue balls decay, that reduces the dark matter abundance again. Why is there always a dimensional six operator? The higgs um, heats? Yeah. You have F squared higgs heats. I think there's let um let me let me double check and get back to you, but I think the situation is that I mean there's a whole range of blue balls with different quantum numbers, and some of them have selection rules that can determine how they can that determine how they can decay. Yeah, so so we end up so we end up five. So this is this is what happens to the allowed region in this in this specific model. Where again, we're looking at the confinement scale and the dark matter mass over the confinement scale. Um, purple regions ruled out because you overflows the universe. Um, these pink and green regions are searches from direct detection and from collider experiments. And the line that gives you the correct dark matter abundance along here 
corresponds to, um, did I not put it on the slide? Okay, corresponds to dark matter mass scales up at the um, EEV plus range. Yeah, okay, we can, okay, let's, let me just uh, see. It. Yeah, so this is the, yeah, so I think this 10 to the 6 line up along here is the, um, is the EEV mass range. It's the line up here. Okay, so I'm basically on my time, so I'll just say like one sort of brief and thing that, yeah, I mean, we, we work on generally this paper, but, but there's, there's sort of a more general statement with these entropy injections, which is, of course, if I have a large entropy injection from any source, it will then lose the abundance of dark matter, and that's a way to make heavier dark matter work in the early universe. A, a sort of simple observation that follows from that is suppose that you've got two particles, one of which is the dark matter, one of which is the metastable partner, that are produced through the same kinds of processes, like they're both produced by freeze out, and they have comparable annihilation cross sections. Then in that case, what happens is that if you dial up the annihilation, if you dial down the annihilation cross section, it means that you have more of both the dark matter and the partner. But then when the dark when the partner decays, it will inject more entropy into the universe and dilute the dark matter by a larger factor. So in that sense, um, the result ends up not depending so much on the absolute value of the annihilation cross section for dark matter and the partner that effectively cancels out. So, yeah, this is just this, this small paper with Koya uh, Asadi and Yuri Smanov, which was just we, we, we just looked into this, asked the question of okay, if you did have a situation like this where you have multiple particles produced by the same types of mechanisms, similar annihilation cross sections. And um, one, decay, one or more decays, the others don't, then you, as, as you might expect, you can have extremely tiny cross sections and sort of there are dark matter abundance just because um, if you have an extremely high tiny cross section, all the particles get populated at a large level when the non stable ones decay. It can only the others. And you can go look at our paper if you want to have uh, useful formulae for. The, for the final abundance of dark matter in any configuration, in various configurations related to that scenario. Okay, so I'll wrap up there. I'll just say well, a, a somewhat natural possible for heavy thermal dark matter beyond the standard unitarity bound is some kind of heavy, strongly interacting dark sector. Um, there's a regime here where the dark quark mass is much heavier than the confinement scale, and we expect there to be a first order phase transition. There are, of course, as we've discussed, other ways to get a first order phase transition in dark sectors. This is just one mechanism. But if you have annihilating dark matter in concert with a first order phase transition and the dark matter is already, already frozen out, then the homogeneity of the first order phase transition can naturally lead to a second phase of strong depletion of the dark matter, allowing you to get the correct early abundance of significantly heavier dark matter. In the particular example that we did, which was heavy SU3 dark matter, there are long lived blue ball states in that dark sector that can generically give rise to an early matter dominated epoch prior to BBM. And so, um, yeah, there, there's so, and, and that so that provides a way to naturally get the correct dark matter up at the when, when these decay, they push the dark matter abundance up even further. Sorry, the dark matter mass scale to get the correct abundance up even further. And at the end, I just talked briefly about, I mean, more generally. Entropy injections can always dilute the dark matter abundance. If you've got a thermally produced metastable partner particle, then there's a trade off between a lower cross section means a higher abundance, means a, a lower abundance means a higher, a lower annihilation cross section means a higher abundance of the dark matter, but also more entropy injection. And so that opens up a wider range of somewhere else around the space as well. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. I'm still confused a little bit about, about the uh, uh, asymmetry. So let's say yeah. you like begin with a, with a, with yeah. a, with a bubble or you have some root end uh, yeah. asymmetry. So we, so as you're saying, it's not easy for them to form uh, uh, baryons. Three of them got to get close together. The strings have got to make this little Y junction and so on. So well, you can get a dichord that lives for some time. Or okay. it gets okay. you make a dichord then, then you just have to get a third one. Uh, okay. 
maybe that, that also. I think that's happen. actually the major mechanism for okay. the formation. I don't think it's the direct well, but, three, but, three body formation. Okay, fine. So it's, but, it's but, my okay, but uh, sure, sure. But, but 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 there's still some difficulty in making the. It, it's not easy to make the variants, which is the the, the reason for the big. Uh, uh, yeah. I think that's the reason. Yeah. What, why? Why you would so, like? So then, that, so, but then, what's what's uh, puzzling me then is then um, uh, why isn't what's going to happen uh, to this excess of uh, uh, quarks just that they'll make these strings that, that you know that go to the surface and exactly the thing which ends up uh, as you said in the percolating picture, sort of erasing the strings. The the thing that produces the strings to begin with is exactly neutralizing, uh, effectively neutralizing to much more than root s. The, the, um, the, the asymmetry in each pocket. So I'm just saying, if, it's, uh, yeah. it, it, the, if they're producing it, yeah. The, oh, but if you have yeah. pockets with some strings going between them, yeah. they separate, all the strings come together, and they start annihilating, right? Yeah, but but I think what I'm what I'm asking is uh, is aren't the strings um, uh, aren't the strings between the pockets? Precisely have uh, you know, and their endpoints, the excess, mostly the excess of quarks and antiquarks. What strength do you think? These are the uh, QCD strings. Uh, well, because this, they, they don't have one. Yeah, that's right. There's some neck color on one side. And so, won't you just pop something out of the vacuum to screen? They're, they're heavy. They're heavy and they're hard. No, they're heavy and they're hard. No, they're but, heavy but, and they're yeah, hard but once the string becomes very long, once the string becomes sufficiently long, you will pop stuff yeah. out of the vacuum. But I, but yes, I, I, guess my, 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 I, I agree with uh, I agree with the one that uh, that if you have this picture with pockets and strings, the strings will annihilate. What I'm asking is is whether the sort of production of those strings with, uh, to begin with is essentially taking up most of the uh, root n asymmetry. If I started off with like some more, anyway, if I start off with let's not call it root n. If I start off with some excess. Of yeah. quarks or anti quarks in one pocket and the other. Isn't that mostly, isn't it I mean, roughly but, ignoring the fact that you could form baryons too on the inside? But to uh but uh but to a begin with, aren't, aren't we just uh taking that excess and producing that many strings, which then eventually annihilate? But 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 I mean I can have a I can have a like overall policy, like okay, let's like say I can have a I can have a color singlet state or a color singlet region that like like that just has quarks in it in the extreme case, right? Like I don't need I mean yeah, but because like I, I don't need an equal number of anti quarks cancel out the quarks, right? Like I mean I in in these, in these pockets I have the gluon plasma as well. Gluons are aligning to screen the like to Yes, let, let, let me see if I can say this. So, yeah, so I mean, certainly like, I mean, you, you can have strings between the quark and the anti-quark, but I don't think, I would think that if I have two pockets, both of which are like individually, you know, color singlet, they've got, you know, the appropriate configuration of quarks within them to be overall color singlet, there is no reason to have a string between those two things, right? I mean, like they can, but I mean, it's not, there's, there's no need for it. I would expect it to, I would expect it to collapse. Maybe thinking about this wrong, and you should feel free to tell me if I'm thinking about this wrong, but like, I don't, I, I mean. That you're, that, 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 uh, the way you phrased the logic is that there's some asymmetry, yeah. um, there's some root asymmetry, and uh, well, it has to be made out. Uh, yeah. that, so that so I, I guess my statement is that like yeah okay so 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 let's say I'm I'm taking you know, I I have I have what starts out as a large region of some collection of quarks and anti quarks and the as the phase transition proceeds you know it would like we we would we would like these re this this region to get to get smaller okay and it can do this by segmenting into smaller regions that have larger surface area for the amount of interior that I have right like that that is the energetically favorable direction and then, and then these pockets are going to shrink I'm going to give it just as the phase transition proceeds because it's more energetically favorable for them to be in a new phase so when I so 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 when I so when I do that division you know like the the pop 
the pockets will try the pockets will try to form. I don't have a great intuition for exactly how this process goes, but but so okay. So let's say you know I, I start to try I start to try to form these two pockets, but each of the pockets like has has net color charge, okay? which is to say that you know like the color charge of the baryons inside it are getting effectively like transmitted to the surface by the fact that the blue ones you know like they'll, they'll sort of you know, the blue ones will align so the side with the appropriate color charge is pointing towards the baryons and the other side is pointing out and, and I'll end up with you know some sort of net color charge for these two pockets which means that I can't separate them completely like there's still there's still a stream going between them right so then um my estimate, would, my guess would be that what happens is these pockets will exchange colored particles until I, so, so like certainly if it was in the U1 case, this was what would happen, right? Like if I had a bunch of particles and antiparticles and I was trying to sort them apart and I sorted them apart such that one was negative, one was positively charged and one was negatively charged, I wouldn't be able to separate them completely. There would be an attractive force between them. And I would move part, charged particles from one to the other until they were both neutral and at that point. And, and at that point, they would separate. So, you know, this may be too naive, but my my guess, my understanding would be that the same thing should, should happen in this case, except there's not an electric charge that I'm trying to move. Like the, the end state that I'm trying to get to, the thing that will allow me to separate the, the pockets without paying a big energy cost is, so is guess, for the most I, I guess what, what I'm asking is, why isn't what happened? I mean, you had this, uh, you had yeah. this first estimate just from the, just from the the, the the annihilation versus the baryon yeah. formation rate for what the actual abundance yeah. is, your purple line or whatever it was. Yeah. And then you said that there's actually a floor coming yeah. from the root end. Yeah. Why isn't it that the why isn't your first estimate actually correct? And that what's happening is that uh, is that you know, so long as the, the asymmetry is there, well, this process is just gonna the strings are also going to still be there, and they're going to be populating guys back and forth. Yeah, good. Uh, so, that's, so that's, I, I think a way to say what. My, yeah, no, what good. My so, so yeah. So, I guess you're saying like we we have this tacit assumption that after percolation, once the pockets are pretty isolated from each other and they're small and they're well separated, the assumption is that the only way that can happen is if is if the strings are no longer there, like, effectively, like if every pocket is already color singlet. Yeah, that's that I'm totally happy with. My, I think, uh, okay. I but, think but, the, the, it seems like there's a second assumption that, that when this percolation has happened and the strings are gone, you're yeah. still left with roughly a root n asymmetry. Yeah. I'm asking is, uh, I guess I'm just asking, couldn't it be yeah. that the- So, so, so you're just asking, right? The so, is actually- So, so, yeah, so, 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 you, yeah, so, so you're basically saying, I, I'm saying that, you, I, I'm saying that you don't need to move, you don't need to reduce the quark anti quark asymmetry to get color singlets. Like you can do it just by just by moving quarks and anti quarks around in equal numbers, provided that you end up with color singlet states at the end. Um, and and thus that I don't expect the quark anti quark. Like you, you're not forced to do it, so that I expect it not to be dramatically reduced. But um, but but that's but that's true. I mean, maybe maybe our maybe our guess is wrong on that. So I mean, your your statement. Because, like, I, I guess I just don't really see why you would expect the quarks and anti quarks necessarily to 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 move to to redistribute themselves to have equal numbers of quarks and anti quarks in this case. Because, like, I mean, you're not being pushed to do that anyway. I mean, maybe maybe, maybe since we've been yeah. So, but, but yeah. So, so I guess my presumption is because you can do it just by just by reaching. Yeah. I, I, it's just yeah, the confusion. I'm just. Uh, okay. It's not a complaint. Yeah. Let's say you have like uh, three times a million yeah. uh, quarks here and three times a million anti quarks there. Yeah. You could say that there's a color singlet state, which is a million baryons on this side, a million baryons on that side. There's no strings. Mm -hmm. That's clearly not what would happen. You would get. So you have strings between them and they would uh, annihilate. So there yeah. is a state, yeah. there is a state, which is a color single slate of a million baryons. That's clearly very unlikely to be the state so, that you're in. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. I, think, yeah. I think it's important that you start from a situation where the bubbles are sort of uh, the confined phase and then you have the confined space, uh -huh. space with, and then these bubbles percolate and throughout this process, there are no big number of strings that are created.
what would be the predictive? So this is one example in a large class. Yeah. And we can dial in the port masses and yeah. so on. And in the end of the day, you can probably get whatever you want. In terms of if I have right. six different flavors of forks and SU3, maybe there's also an SU2, and they all interact with each other. It's kind of another standard model, standard model prime, it's a heavier scale. You can probably dial the parameters and get whatever you want. And in fact, if you think of the simplified model with this scale of field, yeah, I can easily say I throw a few more species here, a few more species there, change. Mm -hmm. so how how predictive will this the nice thing about the naive, naive that's why it was called the miracle. Yeah. That, so that pushes you. Yeah. yeah right. There's, so there's, there's, there are no parameters. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, well, in, in this case, sorry, sure. In the simplest version of this, it's still true that there are, you know, not, that, that, that there are not a, a ton of parameters and it pushes you to sort of like the, the PEV to EEV scale, so predictably, that's it. I agree with you that, you know, as you, so, okay, as, as you expand the scenario and, uh, and, and make it more complicated, you can, I mean, you, you, you can, you can always change the answer. I, I think, I mean, the thing that is, the thing that is less attractive about this compared to the standard double freeze out, I, like, one is just that the, um, like it's it's much less predictive in terms of experimental signatures, right? I mean, it's like I mean that the mass scale is actually like reasonably well constrained, but it's at a mass scale where it's going to be really hard to see indirect detection signatures. And I mean, direct detection you can hope for, but it depends strongly on how you do the coupling with the standard model, which is a bit disjoint from the um, which which is a bit disjoint from the thing that actually sets the partners in the early universe. So. I, I definitely agree it is not as nice as standard, as standard thermal freeze out in the sense of like making us all feel excited that we're going to see dark matter in, in the atom experiments. Um, I do think though that like it's, it's important to think about these, about possibilities like this, because I mean, this to me doesn't seem like a crazy way for the universe to be. And understand, you know, okay, what what would it do? So this, so this tells us, okay, this would push you to well, how do you look for dark matter at the PEV to EEV scale? You are never going to see that at colliders. You um, maybe, you know, in, a, in you may have some hope of seeing the gravitational waves from the early universe phase transition. You may have some hope. There's this if you do have something like this early matter dominating epoch. There's been some work about like that enhancing early structure formation. And if you, or if you have something like the more extreme versions where you have dense clumps of dark matter, you can go look for the dense clumps or the primordial black holes. If you've got early structure formation that leads to much denser clumps of dark matter in the late universe, that can potentially be the signature that you go look for. But so I, I think it is worthwhile to think about both, you know, what does the landscape of dark matter scenarios look like once you push above this sort of 100 TeV to PeV scale? And that if our standard room searches are not going to work up there, then what are what are what are some things that might? But but yeah, I mean I I agree that I mean it's it's always true. There's a huge number of ideas for dark matter, and it's somewhat generically true that if I'm willing to make my model arbitrarily complicated, I, I can I can do arbitrarily complicated things. To me, at least, thinking about what if dark matter was a heavy Finding sector is is in the is 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 in the range of things that seem like they could rather plausibly happen in our universe, and we should understand if that happens, what would the consequences be, and how we would look for it. For example, like the simplest idea in that direction for me sounds like a situation where you have yeah. blue balls, so you have some. Yeah. So I, I think. Um, what happens in that case? Yeah. So so in that case. The thing, so if you make, um, right, so, so yeah, I agree that that's, um, yeah, so this is maybe the, like, next to simplest thing, once you add one quark species in addition to the blue balls, but yeah, like, I mean, you can just say, okay, pure, pure SUM, pure blue, let's, let's understand what happens in that case, and so, and I've, I've had colleagues ask me about that case before, so, like, at, at low, so in, in the pure SUM case, you get a situation where you have to think about, um, 
like where you have to think about like tree body interactions between the blue balls, like tree blue balls go in, two blue balls come out, um, which people call cannibalism because the dark matter kind of devours itself and heats up the dark sector as a consequence. And there are, if it's a purely secluded dark sector, um, that's 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 genuinely pretty hard to see, especially at high mass scales. You can look for the effects of like heat. So you can look for like there are bounds on warm dark matter and hot dark matter to say you can't heat these sectors up too much or you mess with cosmological structure formation. Um, and you can do, and, and if they have sufficiently strong self-interactions in a sufficiently light, you might be able to see um, the effects on the distribution of dark matter from looking for, from looking for their self-interactions. And, and then if they have some, and then if they have some coupling with standard model, then you can then you then you can look for then you can look for the mediators. Of course, once you do that, like you need to make sure that they're still stable or at least have a lifetime that's long compared to the edge of the universe. But yeah, like the fully secluded, no coupling with the standard model except gravitational blue ball scenario is um is is a hard one to find. And so I, I guess the question there is um. The, the good thing about, yeah, so I, I don't actually know this offhand. I can look it up, but like what mass scale do you need in that scenario to get the right abundance of dark matter? And can you do that without messing with like hot and warm dark matter constraints? Because in that case, like there's one parameter, right, which is your confinement scale. And that's the only like parameter in the, so, so yeah, so, so that, so I mean, that should be very predictive. It, it may be, yeah, and, and so it's a it's a sharp question that you can ask about like what do you need to do to get the right abundance of dark matter in that case? And does it require like heating up the dark sector to a point that it's incompatible with observations? But then I think so, so, yeah, so I agree that's the simplest. But then once you say, okay, what if we add one quark species, then something like this may be close to the next simplest. Now we know all the answers. But so remind you that if you want to join a TS, then basically dinner, presenting you a TS. Let's take care again.